Are you an adventurer looking to take your hunt to the next level? Then you're in the right place. Welcome to East Meets West Hunt with your host, Bo Martonic. Hey everyone, welcome back to another episode of the East Meets West Hunt podcast presented by Onyx. As you probably heard me talk about before, Onyx is the premium hunting app available made by hunters for hunters. And one of the tips I want to give with Onyx today is when it comes to shed hunting and specifically when it comes to big woods, mountain bucks, it's, it's, we're coming up on the time of year when we're going to start looking for antlers or you know doing some spring scouting. And some tips for doing that is you can use the, the web map within Onyx to look at areas, identify south-facing slopes where they might be hanging out a lot in the winter, look for different vegetation such as pine trees, hemlocks, any kind of conifer trees, and where they may be bedding, keeping out of that, you know, that thermal cover there. So if you want to go on Onyx ahead of time and be able to check out your scouting areas, you can really help make the best of your time and be efficient when it comes to spring scouting. So if you head over to onyxmaps.com, if you use the coupon code EMW, that'll save yourself 20% off of the hunt app. And Elk 101, so the University of Elk Hunting is the most comprehensive online elk hunting course available. And in addition, have full access to the entire course for one year. You'll have access to the UEH mobile app, which basically puts all the content from the online course right in the palm of your hand, anytime, anywhere, with or without cellular connection. So that's what's really cool about it is while you're in the field, say it's your first time out there, you've never went through the gutless method on an elk and you have your bull, your first bull down in front of you, you can look at that, pull up the video on the app without cell service deep in the back country and you're able to kind of go step by step as Corey talks through how to go through that process. So if you're interested in the University of Elk Hunting online course, Head over to elk101.com and use the coupon code East Meets West. That'll also save you 20% off of uh, the annual membership of the online course. And Mountain Tough. So Mountain Tough Fitness is 12 months of daily online training plus nutrition coaching for every season specifically designed for the backcountry hunter. And that is, of course, their all-access program. And within that, they have a ton of different programs that basically make sure that you're always ready throughout the season. But within within that 12-month program, they came out with two uh, mini programs here in the last week. And the one is the Backcountry Hunter Spring Training Camp. So that's more or less a, a game-changing cardio and endurance uh, program that's that's specifically built for the mountain hunter. It's just a 60-day program. It's a strategic blend of some cardio and strength and kind of get you a good base before you go into the preseason program. And in addition to that, they have the Elite Spring Program, which is if you completed the postseason and the preseason workouts last year on the elite level, then then you might want to try to challenge yourself a little more in this. But this program is definitely not recommended to someone just starting out. It's really trying to achieve goals that are you know, seen unattainable to most people. And while the demands are mostly physical, uh, the journey of this program is, is basically through uh, all about mental toughness. So if you head over to mountaintough.com, you can find a whole lot more information on that there. And lastly, so over the last, um, over last weekend, I guess, I was out down in Harrisburg excuse me, for the Great American Outdoor Show and spent some time at the the Maven Optics booth. Uh, spent time there with, with Cade and uh, a little bit with Mike before he headed out and, and uh, Johnny Utah as well as Jesse Allen. So Jesse's the going to be the guest on this podcast here. Super interesting person and I'm really glad that uh, I was able to get to talk to her and you know, hang out with her for the weekend. Just uh, a great overall human being, along with the along with the other guys in the crew as well. But um, so with Maven Optics, it's um, the way that they're kind of different than some of the other high quality optics. Is 
you know, they're coming out with the highest quality optics available, but at half the price of their competitors. And they're doing that through their direct to consumer business model. So basically without, you know, having to pay the, the sales reps and the retail markup and everything else that kind of goes into that big box store plan, they're able to cut that out and be able to work directly with you, the customer, to be able to come out with the highest quality products with the best customer service at half the price. So if you head over to mavenbuilt.com, you build yourself a custom set of binos, spotting scope, or you can check out the stock options and with the, the binos, spotting scopes, rifle scopes, and you know everything in between there. Use the coupon code EASTMEETSWEST-GIFT and get yourself a free gift with any full price optics order. But uh, like I said, so this episode is with Jesse Allen, and we recorded this at the the Maven cabin here um, in Harrisburg over the over the weekend, and uh, I'm I'm really excited about this one. Every time you know, I'd ask her a question or talk to her, uh, I felt like I was just learning something new that just kind of blew my mind. Like Jesse's definitely done it all. It seems like, and and uh, it's really inspiring from you know, that adventurous lifestyle. If you've, you know, ever wanted to do something and, and, you know, it seems unattainable or anything, you know, I, I think, uh, listening to this, this episode here will show you that it's, it's, uh, really anything's really possible, I guess. So I guess instead of me sitting here and, uh, rambling on much longer, we'll, uh, we'll jump into the episode here with Miss Jesse Allen. All right, welcome back to another episode of the East Meets West Hunt Podcast, and so it's a nice wintry night, I guess, in, in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, after a, a long day at the the Maven Optics booth, and I'm joined by Miss Jesse Allen. Jesse, hi. How, How are, are you? I'm doing great. <laughs> doing great. Glad to be here. Thanks for having me come on, and excited to chat some hunting and all things outdoors with you yeah yeah you uh you have to be absolutely beat <laughs> day what this this wrapped up day number eight for the great american outdoor show yeah this was this is my first time coming to the show never never been out for it and i just went full full in and it was a marathon yeah yeah, you uh yeah, you didn't mess around with this, like first time getting to shows, things like um some things you learned pretty quick about wearing cowboy boots. Yeah. Not a good idea. Not so much. <laughs> <laughs> Note taken for the future. Yep. Yeah. And you know, when you're spending, you know, nine, ten hours a day on your feet on a hard floor, cowboy boots probably aren't the best bet. Maybe not so much. Yep. But <laughs> all things to know for next time, that's for sure. Yeah, no, that's that's cool. I uh, so Mike and Cade from Maven have told me about you now for about a year, and they're like, "You got to get this this chick on the interviews. Like, she's badass, and she's Jesse Allen she's from Lander, Wyoming." And um, so Jesse, do you want to just kind of give a little bit of a, a background of who you are, and you know, kind of where you grew up? Sure. Yeah. So I am from Lander, Wyoming. And I was born and raised there. My family goes back a long time, six generations to be exact. And so, yeah, I was I was raised on my family's wilderness guest ranch. We spend every summer up in the Wind River Mountains in Wyoming. And we're at about 9,200 feet where our cabins are. And have people from all over come and stay in the cabins and uh, and go out on rides or most of what we do is a lot of wilderness pack trips. <clears throat> and so we get a lot of folks that come primarily for fly fishing. Um, a lot of folks coming in for fishing for cuts, uh, brookies, goldens, rainbows. And so we'll pack them into the wilderness. And so I spent every summer of my life working on, on my family's ranch. And now I'm taking it over from my parents and in the, in the middle of, of that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that sounds like, it sounds like a uh, one, a pretty challenging time of your life, but pretty exciting that you've got to live that lifestyle of just being outside and everything yeah. for, for so long. 
Yeah, for sure. It's I, you know, I think I've gotten more and more as I get older, more and more appreciative of that lifestyle of how rare it really is to grow up spending about half of every year in the mountains with no electricity as a kid. And that was just, you know, that was my norm, but now I'm gaining so, so much more appreciation for it and realizing how much I want that for my future. And that's why even, you know, years of being in it, I've just, this is where I want to be and this is what I want to continue on Mm -hmm. and pour my energy into growing the business. Was there ever a point where like you weren't really sure if that was your path or like you kind of like veered away from it at all or anything? Yeah, for sure. So I, I went to the University of Wyoming and I that's where I got my degree. And while I was there, I I did an internship in Washington, D.C. for our congresswoman. And I was really on that track. I was thinking I wanted to go into communications in the political realm and, and work in D.C. And I was kind of picking up momentum with that. And it was at that point that my parents you know, were, after owning this business for 45 years, they were getting ready to retire. And so they were like, well, you know, if that's, if that's the track you're on, then, you know, we're, we're ready to get out of this business. So we might be, you know, looking at putting it up for sale. And, and that was what really shook me and kind of stopped me in my tracks of, okay, well, like if this is something I want to carry on, then, um, that's, I need to really stop and think and, So I was drawn back to the ranch. I wasn't ready to see it go and just decided to dive in and give it a good shot of keeping it going. And that's where I'm at. Yeah. Yeah. And um, so also you you were doing some other activities too, like other things outside of the hunting and outdoor space as well, doing a little bit of, um, how, how do you explain it? Yeah. So, well, during the... During the summertime, do a lot of wilderness trips. Um, I I lead some wellness trips, Mm -hmm. mostly. Uh, I started doing those about five years ago, trips for women. And so we were riding in and camping for a week. And uh, we're camping with the horses, doing yoga, riding out every day, and hiking up. You know, we'll park at a lake and do some fly fishing and then maybe hike up to a glacier and uh do that kind of with the wellness aspect at the forefront of the, of the conversation and, uh, and then started gearing up more toward leading some fitness trips for men and women, just really focusing on overall health and wellness in the outdoor space. Cause you just, when you're up at nine to 12,000 feet working outside with your hands every single day, you get get in pretty good shape. Yeah. And so to like provide a provide a trip for people to come on and be uh, focused on that is something I've been really passionate about. And then yeah, and then in the fall gearing up for guiding hunters, we we guide for uh in September for elk and for archery and then in October uh rifle elk, mule deer and pronghorn antelope. Okay. Yeah. So yeah, that's that's pretty that's pretty awesome and and so I guess like you know growing up in you know that I guess that outdoor lifestyle and everything else with you know it's pretty lucky one like like you were saying you 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 know realize how fortunate you know growing up in that kind of atmosphere and and you and I were talking you know on the drive back tonight just about you know once you leave for a little bit how much you appreciate coming back and yeah. And all those things, you know, it's, it's, it's wild, really. For sure. Yeah, absolutely. And that's, I, I it was always my norm, you know, mm-hmm. I just, that was how I was born and, and, or what I was born into and raised in. And I tr- try really hard not to ever take that for granted. Now I'm realizing that I was, yeah, I'm lucky that when my parents were, leaving for work, that meant going outside to do chores. And I was always at the heels of my dad. I mean, I was always his little right hand gal. And to be able to work alongside my 
my parents has been um, something I feel really, really fortunate for. And, and the, yeah, the older I got it, the more I was realizing like, this is how I want to raise my family someday. And this is the, the dream I want to, that my dad cultivated when he was younger and then brought to life. And I want to keep the momentum with it. Yeah. Yeah. No, that, that's really cool. And so, you know, within that, you're talking about some of these trips you're doing and, you know, a lot of them, like with the health and wellness side of things, and I know that's a big, you know, part of your life, it seems like, and, and, and you like that. So explain about like some of, some of these trips that you are doing within that, that the health and wellness side of things and kind of how that, you know, I guess portrays into, you know, your everyday health and life and then also just the, the hunting seasons and grinding it out through the the whole the whole time frame, you know what I mean? I don't know if I explained that real well, but uh um, It's good. But, yeah, yeah. So roll with it. Okay. <laughs> Can chill. Yeah. I'll just start talking, I'll see where it goes. No, so I guess the when I first decided I wanted to to do that kind of offering, uh well it originally stemmed from wanting to provide a trip for, for women to sign on to, uh, just cause I've been guiding my entire life. And, uh, the first, like for instance, the first trip I did alone, I was 13. I packed in a group of fishermen, which was about a five hour ride into the mountains, dropped them off five hours out and, and by myself in that way was, that was always kind of like the rite of passage. Um, to do that trip alone. And anyway, the more I got involved in, in being a guide, the more I started noticing that there was hardly ever groups of just women coming on trips. And so the older I got, the more I wanted to provide a space that women could sign on to as individuals and feel really comfortable. And for me to be empowering them in these skills of being competent in the backcountry. And then that kind of also morphed into incorporating more of a wellness focus and uh, my passion for yoga. I'm a yoga teacher. I, I did, um, I studied in Thailand to get certified to be a yoga teacher. And so I wanted to bring that aspect back and kind of collide my two passion or two of my passions, which is living an active outdoor lifestyle with yoga and holistic wellness and kind of intertwine those passions. Mm -hmm. So that's been really cool to see coming into fruition. And uh, last year, the New York Times mentioned my women's wellness trips as top 52 places to visit in 2019. Yeah, it was rad. I, that was kind of, I didn't know that was happening. That was a cool surprise, but but it's kind of wow. Yeah, that I it's kind of gotten more recognition and and a lot of the gals that have come on trips have have started coming on repeat trips and now what I think is the coolest thing is that a lot of these women who've come on trips are are expressing interest in hunting now and I have a few gals that I am uh with that applied for for elk tags this year which I'm psyched about and they've never hunted in their lives really? but they kind of saw you know they just felt that access of you know if if that's what like one of my other strongest passions is is yeah. hunting and um to kind of help create that avenue into exploring what is hunting has been really cool to see you know, that's, that's, that's just super cool. You know, there's a lot of talk about, you know, with the hunters numbers declining, you know, across the U S and everything, yeah. like, how do you really recruit other people? And there's, you know, there's a lot of, you know, traditional ways of, you know, just taking people hunting and stuff. But I think that's a really unique approach that you have there, whether yeah. that was intentional or not, like, but by showing, you know, you're getting these women out there, you know, active lifestyle, getting out and, and with some of your trips, but by you, you know, you know, talking about your hunting and stuff, it sounds like, yeah. and everything, they gauge this interest, like, okay, I, you know, I respect this woman, you know, and the way she lives her life. Like, I'll, maybe I want to try that or open it up. Like, I think that's a really cool, um, I guess, avenue to it. And, you know, because you're not like pushing 
anything on For someone, sure. you know, they're making their own decision based on that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And I think uh, that's something that I'm always kind of uh, trying to live by is just diversifying myself as much as possible. And that the more you can kind of live in multiple worlds, you can kind of create those avenues for bridging the gaps between these two, like for instance, the yoga community with the hunting community (laughs) and the pageant world. When I was doing stuff with uh, being Miss Wyoming, I mean, there's all these parts of my life that seem kind of contradictory, but I see it as a way to kind of bridge the gaps between those worlds of, yeah. of things that seem to be, you know, seemingly divided, but showing that you can have a lot of crossover and hopefully being a represented representation of that idea of like, you know, shaking up that stigma of what someone might think of as a hunter. And then they see me who is a yoga teacher and, a pageant person in a former life, they're like, okay, maybe that is something I could try out too. And and kind of express my ethos on what is hunting and having people realize that that's something they may connect really closely with too. Yeah. That that is crazy. You do have like some different paths that are like completely on opposite ends of the spectrum almost. And, and, uh, so with, within the, going back to like the, the yoga standpoint and in regards specifically to hunting, you know, do you, what kind of benefits can you see from people doing that? So I actually short story is, uh, the other day, uh, a guy that i met, um, out of ATA this year, his name is Ted Bright. And he, he sent me, um, Marco Polo. Do you know what Marco Polo is? Mm-mm. It's this app where you like video chat oh, people like, yes, but, like I the, do. the messages like you leave whatever yeah. so anyways he yeah, messaged yeah. me and he just asked me out of the blue he's like hey i know you're really into fitness stuff and everything you know um i heard you talk about like some of your strength workouts you're doing this time of year do you do yoga and he's like he's like dude i do yoga like a lot and it's, yeah. it's telling me all these benefits from it and it's really interesting i kind of want to cool. hear your you know side of things on that yeah Absolutely. I, I mean, I, I love it. I, I grew up dancing and, um, was on the dance team in college and have always just, I love to move my body and, you know, be physically active. And, and so I didn't, I started doing yoga when I got older, just as a way to reconnect with dance a little bit, just because as I, when I graduated college and didn't have the dance team anymore. I was thinking, you know, what could be semi similar. And so I started doing yoga and then I started noticing how much, but like just how good I felt overall. Like I was feeling more mobile, but kind of just like this sense of calmness when I was, whenever I'd be feeling stressed, kind of ease some anxiety. And so yeah, I just got more and more into it. And I think, uh, it provides a lot of crossover, um, for folks that are just feeling really stressed out and tense, you know, whether that's showing up physically or mentally, it's just really helpful. Yeah. 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 That- really helpful <laughs> overall. Yeah, it sounds like it. And and like, and that's not the first, you know, not the first person that said that, but I, like I said, I know you're, you know, really into it. And, and as we were talking about before we started recording, just mobility in general has been like a big focus for myself personally, as mm-hmm. I am not naturally very mobile per like yeah. or flexible person, I guess, from any means. And I felt like I was always hurting and like, just, just yeah. getting like small injuries that were just more of a pain in the ass than anything. And, mm-hmm. you know, as I've been just doing different stretches and I, I don't, um, I don't know a whole lot about it, but I just try to do different things and it seems to really be helping me out quite a bit with just recovery time from things and, you know, again, injury prevention and just a whole bunch of different stuff there. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, my kind of my number one thought with, with that is, yeah, like you said, just wanting to like prevent injury, especially when, when you're in the back country and, my 
what's always on my mind is I want to be just especially strong and competent and capable to uh, take care of people and my horses and myself when I'm in the back country. Because as the guide, I feel I'm pretty loaded with responsibility for not only keeping myself safe, but looking out for all the people that I'm guiding and the horses. And so if there ever is any kind of incident where I need to, you know, run up to 12,500 feet to get a signal in order to make a call, if, you know, if my, whatever, if, if something's happening or if I need to be carrying a hundred pounds of meat on my back for, uh, out of a boulder bowl or whatever it is to just get out of some sketchy situations. I yeah. want to make sure my body isn't like, if I get injured, then it's a risk for the entire group. And so keeping myself strong and healthy is priority. And if I can help other people do the same and, and have a focus on that, it, it's great for yeah. everybody. Well, what's, <laughs> what's kind of ironic and, and funny about this whole situation is right now we're talking about, you know, healthy living and, you know, I, and I, I live a pretty, I'd say pretty healthy lifestyle and for uh -huh. the most part. And, and you definitely do. And it's like, <laughs> we were just talking about how just shitty we feel like I know. <laughs> <laughs> eating all this food and, totally. and ice cream and stuff yeah. today and like, just in total brain fog. Like little I don't bit. think either little, of our <laughs> brains are working at a hundred percent right now. I feel like mine's working somewhere around 32, 33%. I'm with and... you. I feel you so <laughs> closely right now. <laughs> yeah. It's uh, but yeah, it's, it's just funny. It's making me like almost, um, feel guilty about like talking about this, <laughs> but no, it's, it's, it's all cool. Yeah. Um, but it is, I mean, you can feel those differences when you eat, like shit and yeah. I, you know personally it's just the more aware and the more conscientious I am about wh what I'm eating and drinking and my activity level and like as much time as I spend outside and soaking in that vitamin D like I just feel so like tuned into it now you know yeah. that when yeah when I get a little off track it's like pretty evident <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I know. But I mean, I think that's a good thing, though, that because like once you do get off track and you feel that like you don't let yourself stay on it for a, yeah. you know, a long period of time. I know with with me now, like it's like even if I go like a week for some reason without working out or doing something, it's not that like, oh, I'm just going to fall apart. But like I get it in my head like I just like I need this. Like yeah. I feel so good when mm -hmm. I'm in a consistent you know schedule that I love waking up at I wake up four fifteen every morning and go out and, and I work out before work and like or or depending on the time of year, maybe I'll go for a run in the mornings before work or something just like mm -hmm. it just makes you feel so good and like when I'm eating clean and just it's amazing what your body does. Like and, and you have to do it for a sustained amount of time. Like you can't yeah. eat clean one day and be like, I didn't feel any better. Well yeah. you gotta kinda get yourself on that that and I I'm just such a big proponent of it and even with I don't I don't know how um you are but I'd like to hear like when uh when you're going in on these hunts and guiding and stuff do you mm -hmm. like meal prep in any ways or like do you I feel like you geek out on this <laughs> No I you don't, don't? Geek okay. out. No I eat all and any food that is in front of my face I okay. mean <laughs> yeah no especially in especially when I'm guiding I mean I will just slam all the calories in any way, shape and form they come to me. And I do, I mean, we like to have good meals p planned out for the hunters. So we'll be cooking really good food, but it's just, you know, it's got a, it's got a lot of calories to keep you going. Yeah. When we're, Cause we'll have, for instance, say when we're in rifle elk camps, we ride in on horseback, we'll go, anywhere up to 20 miles into the wilderness and be, we'll set up wall tents and be uh, base camped from there and then riding out on horseback each day. So usually we're having breakfast at 4 a.m. and then we'll be out all day long, uh, ride to a spot and then tie the horses up and 
be hiking and, and hunting all day. And so when there's days where I'm up at 3 a.m. and catching horses in the dark, chipping ice off of their hobbles and, you know, just constant movement and in the snow and up to almost 12,000 feet sometimes, it's like you need all the calories yeah. you can get to stay warm and to stay functional. And so that was my very long way of saying uh, when it comes to when it comes to uh, the amount of physical movement I'm doing in the depths of hunting season, yeah, food prep isn't necessarily at the forefront of my mind. Okay, <laughs> uh, no, that's that's good. That's it's interesting. Like, I mean, you know it from doing this for so long. But I, you know, when I started Western hunting, I didn't know anything about the exact amount of calories and stuff. Sure. Basically, that I was gonna. Burn. Not yeah. that you need to know the exact amount, but more or less, like it's a lot. Like, you're, yeah, you're, totally, you're, you're killing it. And like, I remember I had everything listed out. Like, I'm a planner by like I just had like all my food, how many fat calories, how many pr- grams oh, of protein. Dang. Like, I had it all out by day, and I had nice. them in the Ziploc bags and put it all together. But thing was, I was only planning for like 2,500 to 3,000 calories per day, which feels like a lot for a normal day but when you're there after like day 11 of my hunt I was hunting 14 days and I was just Mm -hmm. my body shut down like my immune system crashed and just like I was just one side um mountain tough fitness has this calculator online where you can figure out the calories you burn based on Mm. pack weight and all this other stuff so anyways I did it after I came back and I was burning like (sighs) probably 6,500 calories a day you know hiking anywhere from eight to 14 miles a day and with mm-hmm. the pack on and up and down. And, and so I was just, yeah. just killing myself based <laughs> on that. And it felt, I didn't realize that based on the, you know, the food, but, um, yeah, it was, it was interesting. So more or less now I, I definitely bring a lot more food mm-hmm. <laughs> and f- even when I'm not hungry, just like force myself, like yeah. eat. Absolutely. I, I'm, <laughs> this, I'm the same way too. And knowing the altitude can sometimes, be affecting your appetite at the beginning of, especially at the beginning of your trip. If you're going up in altitude and if you're just not really feeling that appetite, I just, mm-hmm. I force feed myself even during those times. Cause I know I need the calories. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so yeah, that's, that's a, that's an interesting part. Like I said, of just the whole, I, I always wondered like with someone like you, that's doing this for a whole season. Like I know for me mm-hmm. after two weeks, I'm freaking <laughs> just whooped you know yeah. like this that's got to be just a straight grind to get yeah. through uh how long is a, the guiding season typically for you yeah so well for guiding hunters we archery season starts up september 1st and then i'll be guiding archery elk all through september and then the last bit of september we'll ride in ahead of time to set up the the wall tents for the rifle elk camp which we do throughout the first couple weeks of October. And then the last few weeks of October, I'm guiding for mule deer and, and pronghorn hunters. So, uh, yeah, that's the, and I will say to kind of touch on just how, how you said, yeah, it's like two weeks of it is pretty exhausting. I would say more than anything, like I love, I thrive in the physical, just the nonstop movement, working hard. I love feeling strong and energetic in the mountains. Um, I would say what wears on me the most is just like the mental stamina of all of it, because it is, it is one thing to be hunting for myself. And it is a whole nother ball game to be guiding hunters where I am carrying that weight of knowing all the preparation that they have put into this hunt, all the planning, you know, the years of putting in for tags and finally drawing and choosing us as the outfitter through looking at hundreds of others and and they decide to come with us and, uh, and they put so much into it that I, I carry that so heavily on my shoulders. I want more than anything for them to be successful. Yeah. Like I want for them to be successful more than I've ever wanted it for myself, to be honest. And so that is just what lights the fire under my ass, but it also 
wears me out a yeah. little bit, you know, it's, it's like that, just that, that desire to work my ass off in every, in every way to make sure that it's a phenomenal experience. Um, you know, however they, if, if they're punching their tag and what size of animal they get or whatever, it's all the little pieces of making sure that they have a horse that they're getting or a couple horses that they're rotating each day and getting along with that. Um, they're eating really good food, that they're sleeping comfortably, that their feet are staying dry and warm and like always just want to make sure that they have a good experience is that's what weighs on me more than the physical strain of it. Yeah. That's, and I, I get to see, uh, I guess the reward aspect of that tonight, you know, well actually all day you've had people that have went with you come in and stop at the booth mm-hmm. and, you know, talk to you and just like, you know, be and you could tell you were so excited to see them. Like it was a, it's like a big part of like, you know, a big extended family, I guess, for you to have some of these people that you spend, you know, a week with at a time, you get to really know somebody. Yeah. And, you know, today we had, uh, we, when we drove to the show and everything, you had an elk rack in the back of the, my truck and then gave it to one of the hunters that yeah. to look on his face when he, you gave it to him. Yeah. He was so pumped. Like yeah. it, and you could just tell that was like, you know, sure. I'm sure very satisfying yeah. on your end to see that. Yeah, for sure. And, and I was glad we could drive it out for him so he didn't have to ship it. He's a, a guy that lives in Pennsylvania and he was looking at shipping it out here. And I was like, no, man, I mean, we'll sh- save you on that shipping expense and just drive it out in the Maven truck. So we brought it out to him and, and yeah, I mean that it, it, guiding people like him who he was just in it with every percentage of his, I, uh, he, he was one guy who we were hunting together for a week and, uh, he never wanted to take a nap. He wanted to hike as much as he could to see as much as he could. I mean, he was fully in it and grateful of like all the details that go into the whole thing and just constantly thanking the staff. And, and that is like the ultimate reward yeah. for me. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm sure like getting those types of hunters in camp just makes it all mm-hmm. worth it. Totally. And he, that guy in particular, I guided him on a muley hunt two years ago, and then he came on this elk hunt, and now he's coming to the ranch with his family for a week to really? do a fly fishing trip. Yeah. So that's kind of my, I, I love that part of it. I love seeing them come back and share it with their families and, and experience it in different ways. So, yeah. Yeah. That's, that's cool. When, so a lot of the, the people that you have that you're, you know, guiding and doing things, are they repeat clients or they, do you have some newer ones? Like what, yeah. how does that look? Uh, kind of all across the board. We've been in business now for 40, going on 48 years. My dad and his three brothers started the operation. And so over the years, yeah, we've had a lot of return clients. Um, yesterday I had lunch with two people who also live in Pennsylvania. They're a couple who's been coming to our place for 12 years in a row. And, um, and I love that. I mean, I love to see people returning and telling their friends and family and, and bringing them out to share it with. But, but I'm also realizing that I, yeah, I, I want to expand to op like offer, new avenues for people to explore the wind rivers. And that could be through my passion of fitness and health. And, um, and I'm also leading a youth trip this summer. So hoping to get some more kids up and up and out there. Cause that's like what I, I personally love uh, more than anything is sharing, sharing it with kids and getting them really excited about the outdoors. Jeez, you, <laughs> I feel like the more I talk to you, the more different avenues I feel like you go down and like, I, like all over the place. I think I it's, get it's, a it's, little scattered. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you stay super busy, but it's, it's, yeah. it's cool because you can hear like the, the excitement, you know, and passion in your voice. And that's what, like, yeah. you know, everything about like this podcast and everything else that 
I can't even say the word podcast anymore because <laughs> <laughs> the guys here uh, may even apparently maybe everyone that's listening already knows, but they say that I say it like podcast, like real weird and <laughs> only slightly. <laughs> so now when I say it, it's like self conscious in my head. But anyways, uh, the whole reason for this, um, you know, podcast is. Uh, <laughs> around like, you know, sharing, you know, adventures like that and showing, you know, going outside your comfort zone and doing different things. Mm -hmm. That's like anything is possible. We get, yeah. you know, one, one chance and don't want, want me to sound like overdramatic or anything, but truthfully, like there's so many things that you could do and just outdoors, especially, yeah. and just live more of a fulfilled life, I guess, for lack of better terms. Yeah. Is that, <laughs> yeah. is that Amen. exactly how you feel? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Amen. Yeah, I think uh, the outdoor spaces can do a lot of good for for people in so many different ways, whether that's through the avenue of hunting or rock climbing or mountain biking and or horse packing, whatever it is. Wilderness and yoga. So, wilderness yoga, man. Is that what you call it? I'm what not do you sure. Call it? I mean, just yoga. Wellness trips. Okay. I don't know. Yoga. You got to come up with like some I know. real like badass name. It's like, like you hear it and it's like, oh, that's Jesse that's Allen. It's like, that's I know. the thing. I need like, okay. Yeah. Call you, me out. We'll talk. Yeah. Yeah. We'll, we'll okay. talk. I, yeah. <laughs> oh, I'll give you my prices and then we'll go. Okay. From there. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, but uh, no, seriously, that's, that's, there's so many different like avenues like that and like combining some of those mm -hmm. different things is, is really, really awesome. Do you, um, being like, so being like a, you know, a woman guide and anything, does those have any, like, do people like, are they surprised or they know going into it? Like I, how, what is that like? Yeah. Uh, definitely when I first started guiding hunters, it was more, more of a surprise to folks. And I would feel pretty awkward when I would like just see that flash of surprise or, in my mind, it looked like a little bit of disappointment on their face of like, oh shit, really? Like I'm going to be guided by this girl who is half my age. And so I was always a little uh, self-conscious about that in the beginning of uh, feeling like I couldn't look too feminine because then I wouldn't be respected as much. And so I had to like you know, deepen my voice a little bit and like hey. make sure I wasn't wearing like very feminine clothes. And, but honestly, I've always, it's just my mindset is like once we get into the back country and my work ethic speaks, should speak for itself. And I'm just always hustling and being productive and proactive and like, uh, maybe that stemmed from being a kid growing up in guiding summer trips too, is that I was always kind of underestimated there. I mean, starting as a 13 year old girl packing in groups of fishermen, there were many times where, where people would be pretty surprised to see this teenage girl packing them into the wilderness yeah. 20 miles. And, and so I just, my mindset was always like, let your work ethic speak for itself. And so just always working really hard. And, and so then now as a, as a guide, I mean, I do a lot of the back and forth correspondence with our hunters. So they're well aware before they show up that yeah. I may very well be their guide. Um, a lot of our other guides are, well, all of our other guides are men and they're older than me and have been doing it for a long time. But, um, but I'm really comfortable and yeah. happy in the role. And we get really, really good down to earth guys who are just excited to be in the wilderness and hopefully fill a tag. And yeah, yeah, that's, that's really cool. Like I said, I just, I wondered like how that, like, cause it's not every day that you have, you know, so a girl that was doing, you know, miss was miss Wyoming yeah. and then <laughs> is a hunting guide. You know, it's right. just, it's just not something that's, you know typical across know. the board i think it's i think it's awesome though that yeah. that you you do that and like i said just and love it and and show you know women to across the board do whatever yeah. you want to do that's it's up totally. to you do it 
Amen. Yeah. And a lot of these hunters, you know, may have daughters that they're, so we connect on that piece of it too, that they're like psyched to see me as a young woman who is all in and, and loving this lifestyle of hunting and, you know, packing their elk out of the mountains and in my backpack. And, and they're, they're like this, I want my daughter to, you know, get to meet you and, and, see what is what is possible as a young woman and that yeah I so we connect on that that part of it a lot too that's that's so cool so with within um I guess within the the hunting guiding experience you know do you have like say one story or one hunt that sticks out in your mind as something like this is this is why I do this, or this is why I want to continue to do this, or just a, a good story. Yeah. Anything along those lines. I'd, sure. Um, do you have anything that you can mm. think of? Oh, gosh. Oh, so many. Um, okay. Let me just. Okay. I'm here. I'm with you now. You got it? I got it. That actually okay. went quicker than I expected. Oh, really? Yeah, I expected, like, <laughs> I expected you know, the, the, no. the brain fog to kind of Mm-mm. sink in for a few minutes. No, no. <laughs> there was some fog. It cleared. The clouds had parted. I saw, and when you asked that, I had so many faces come to mind, which is something, like, I'm super grateful for that, that there are so many reasons why I do what I do and why I'm so passionate about this job. Uh, but one instance in particular was at the end of our season, I guided the most phenomenal young man I have ever met. And it was such a cool way to wrap up a really busy, hectic season. And, and I'm not going to lie after two months of guiding, I was, I was pretty well drained and, but I had one hunter left and I was like, okay, I've got to, you know, pour pour it all into this. Um, so this g- kid, uh, his name is Steven and he's a 12 year old boy who, uh, he came with me through the outdoor dream foundation, which is a similar organization to make a wish, but it's, it sends kids on hunts or fishing trips of their choice. And it's for kids with serious illnesses. And Stephen has Duchenne's muscular dystrophy. Um, He's from Charleston, South Carolina. And he has this really horrible disease that is, his muscles are just disintegrating, you know, eating away. And so he's in a wheelchair and uh, he's doesn't have all the time in the world. And, um, has a fairly short life expectancy. And, and so he he came on a hunt with me for a mule deer this fall. And let me tell you about Steven. He is, I mean, he's the coolest kid. We, we hit it off right away. He's this witty, charming, blue eyed, freckle faced little boy who, um, he was just a lot of fun to hang out with. And he was fully psyched on the entire experience. Uh, we ended up getting, a nice muley buck and I was like trucking him around on my back and, and cause he can't walk at all. Um, so I got him, uh, we were hunting on, on this ranch since he was pretty, you know, obviously limited mobility wise. Uh, so we were fortunate to be hunting on this ranch and we got to this spot first thing in the morning, we watched a herd of about 40 muleys. It was really cool. Actually, we watched them go from where they were feeding down into this river and they crossed the river, uh, had to swim across and go to this area where they were bedding down. So we ended up sticking around that area all day. And sure enough, that evening we watched all the 40 plus deer swim across the river. And I, crawled with Steven into position to get him into a spot where when these two bucks, they were the last to cross after a while, they popped up and, uh, and we, we got a shot on, on a nice buck and he had to, we used a trigger mechanism. So it was like through with a straw and it was hooked up to these batteries and 
switches and all this electrical stuff to make there be a bolt on my trigger. And maybe you've seen things like this before on TV. I'm, I don't really watch, I don't watch TV. So apparently this thing, you know, people have seen on hunting shows, but I, I hadn't ever used it before. So that's what we use. So I was sighting the animal and told him when to blow on the straw. And so he did and it worked great, made a solid shot. It was uh, not too far. I mean, it was about 160 yards maybe. And, uh, but we, in one shot, dropped him perfectly. And it was such a positive experience for him with hunting. He had hunted a little bit before, but, um, but that was, he was psyched out of his mind. Yeah. <laughs> and so was I. And um, so that, to answer your question of like why I do what I do to see him have such a positive experience with that and know that I I am able to be helping, you know, provide those experiences is, is pretty special. And side note, Steven. So then I went, I visited him in Charleston. I spent Thanksgiving with his family. He has a single mom and a sister and then this summer, he's going to come out and spend a few weeks at the ranch with me. And yeah, he's excited to learn about being a cowboy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's going to be great. And where is he from? So he's from Charleston, South Carolina. Oh, yeah, okay. yeah, okay. yeah, he did yeah, say that. Yeah, Charleston. So he's he's going to so cool. come up to the ranch. And so his sister is going to do the youth trip with me and Steven's gonna Steven's gonna stay at the ranch for a few weeks and I you know to be able to provide that experience with him is is pretty special yeah so yeah that story is awesome and that's a good way to end your season like you said that was your last hunt and you know that's that's super inspiring when so within like whether this is a, a hunting trip or one of the other guided tours you have, what is like the the craziest experience you've had? Or maybe like a, a time where it was like it really tested you, whether from like a, a weather standpoint or something went wrong, like something that like put you in an uncomfortable position. Oh man. Am I getting into hard questions no. now? No, <laughs> it's, uh, I'm trying to think there's, I mean, the weather always tests you in some in some ways. Yeah. But as my daddy taught me, there's never any bad weather, just bad gear. So I try to be <laughs> equipped for any and all things. Um, yeah. So uh, what comes to my mind is this experience when I was 17 and we had a group of fishermen that showed up and I was assigned as their Wrangler. So I was going to pack them into this lake. It's about a 20 mile ride in and we go up and over this 12,000 foot pass uh, where you're above timberline for about four hours. It's just rock and you ride across a glacier for part of it. It's pretty cool. Um, But, and then you drop into this drainage. And so I was assigned as their Wrangler and they showed up, there's like four guys. And when I went out to introduce myself and shake their hand and, and say, I'd be taking their, them into this spot the next day, they were like very surprised. And they actually started laughing. They thought I was kidding. <laughs> I was like, no, no, it's real. It's real life. And so they actually, they felt really uncomfortable with it because I was such, I was just a young teenage girl. So they, went to my dad and they were like, we don't feel comfortable with this. Um, you know, we'd like to have, like to have, uh, somebody older, um, one of these guys pack, pack us in. And my dad has always, you know, always had my back in that way. And he was like, no, she's, she's got, she covered, she's been doing it her whole life. And anyway, so we ended up, uh, the next day when we were packing in, it just started raining and it was a nonstop like rain all day. Um, when we were up above Timberline, it started hailing and it's like hailing sideways when you're up there, you're above Timberline for four hours and you know, the horses are just getting pelted with hail and these guys are getting drenched and they didn't have the best rain gear. And so they were pretty cold. So I was always 
checking in on him and lent one of them a layer of mine to like put over his lap. And anyway, so we get to the spot and it, it finally let up later in the afternoon. And, uh, it's a nine hour ride one way to cover 20 miles. I drop them off and then I tie the horses, string them up and turn around and do the ride out on my own. And they were like, they did come up to me as I was leaving. They're like, or just want to apologize. Like we really kind of showed us that, um, yeah, that we underestimated you. And yeah. anyway, so yeah, then I, I turned around and ride, rode the whole way home, which is a pretty common ride that I do. It's about 18 hours round trip, um, which, it, yeah, well, I'll be getting back to the ranch at about two in the morning. So I spent a lot of time riding in the dark and which is pretty cool. I, I enjoy it. It's if you just like imagine it dark and you can just see the sparks of the horse's shoes on the rocks. So I'll be looking back to make sure things are fine with the horses and I just see sparks and the moon and the stars and it's all very peaceful. It's quite nice. Yeah. yeah. That's, that's <laughs> that wasn't that crazy of a story, but that's what came to my mind as yeah. far as like shittiest weather combined with feeling fairly underestimated by yeah. the guys and that was kind of this like big yeah big trip for me that I don't know. no no that's no that's a good answer that's a good trip and I, I think like one of the things that that I guess I admire the, not to say the most but admire a lot about like what you do and some of the different things is just like the the mental side of it to get through. I mean, little things mm-hmm. that not even really little things, but like those people underestimating you, you know, at that portion, I get can probably get in your head, you know, yeah. and then, you know, adding weather and, and the conditions from, you know, the animals not, um, say if the animals weren't really, uh, cooperating with what you want or, mm-hmm. um, the, the people you're, you know, with say there's just a whole bunch of different things that can, if you're not in a real good headspace, I feel like can yeah. can derail you. Absolutely. And I know my my first trip out west. I told this story before, but like I feel like I was extremely mentally weak when mm-hmm. like that I didn't know that until I hmm. spent you know seven days out there and like on day like five, I felt like I was like breaking down in my head. I was like, hmm. why am I doing this? This sucks. Like you know the whole and I was getting like you know, like snappy with my brother, my cousin, just being like a, not a good partner to be with. And, and, but that was like an eye opening trip for me. I was like, all right, quit being a little bitch. Like it's time to, you know, get your shit together. And I feel like, you know, after that, it just made things when I came back to the normal, I'm going to call it the easy life of living the, you know, 21st century American dream. And, (laughs) and yeah, it just made me like appreciate so many things and, and, those things aren't as big of a deal anymore. Like the things I thought that like I used to complain about, or I hear people complain about at work. I'm like, no, like it's not when you're focused on, you know, food, water, Mm -hmm. hunting, like simplify the hell out of it. And like, it just makes you appreciate so many things and not worry about the little things that are in the external. And I, I think that's, you know, again, you and I talked about this, but like, there's like these things in your, in your life where there's times that you have that you don't realize are really life changing, but they are at the same time. And like what what I'm getting at, I was like this trip, I, I didn't know until afterwards that it was such a big deal for me, but it changed kind of the course of my life. I mean, well, hell now I have a podcast that's surrounding it, but like just, I was, I think I was going down a road where I was just getting caught up in things that I didn't need to worry about or like just little things that just simplifying your life, taking it back and getting through these hard things and, and, you know, just working your ass off towards goals. Like it just, I guess that was a really long winded way of saying it, but that's just what your whole story and some of these things remind me of, of like, I don't know. I just feel like it's a pretty damn good way to live. (laughs) Well, I mean, I, yeah, I not, not easy, but I good. agree with all that you just said, and and it is. I I notice that in my mind so much. Just the difference of when I'm living all summer, I spend 
May through October up in the mountains and no electricity, no cell service, no Wi-Fi, very difficult to contact. I'm sorry, but I just, I feel so good. (laughs) I'm just, I am, it's a simplified life and yeah, it feels good to just detach and connect with the people you're with and be focused on the greater scheme of things. There's not too many people I can say in like today's, I sound old saying that and I'm not old whatsoever. <laughs> no, yeah. I, you and I are both not old, good. but like, it's like, but like, <laughs> we're so wise. I, yeah, I know. <laughs> I know. Yeah. But like, just as far as like living in today where you're always connected and it's fast yeah. paced, hardcore, like you don't ever, it's hard to get like a real like connection with, you know, say people or experience or things like, but mm. when you're there, like yeah. you have a true connection or like just things like I know that's totally. when, when I go with my, my brother, my buddies or my dad or whatever, go on these hunting trips. Like that's his, like, I just, I don't know. I just feel like I smile the whole time. Cause like, it's just <laughs> like, I, I don't know. I love it. Like I look yeah. forward to it every year and just being able to completely just engage in, in that, you know, every little detail and just, I don't know, embrace it. Mm hmm. It's good stuff. It is. It's real good stuff. Yeah. All right, Jesse. So I'm going to have one more question for you. All sure. Right. This is a question I used to ask all guests at the end of the podcast. And I don't know whatever happened to it, but I just lost this question. I forgot about it. Oh. But my, my, one of my motto is like, I have, it's on my logo. It's on everything. It says, how do you define adventure? Mm. So if you were to define the word adventure to you, what does adventure mean? Adventure means like actively leaning into areas that you feel okay. Wait, 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 wait. Can we scratch all of that out? No, we're not. No, gonna come edit. on. No, you're gonna. You're just gonna keep rolling with it. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. <laughs> Let's see here. Mm. Ah, okay, okay. Adventure to me means actively opening your mind to areas that seem a little scary or intimidating, but at the same time exciting and invigorating. And so you kind of just lean into it and and pour your energy into seeing where it takes you. Yeah. And And then being open to the growth that can come from that. Yeah. That was a very long winded answer. So basically I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to dumb this down. From yeah. What I, what yeah. I take yeah. as yeah. a synopsis of what you just said was basically going outside your comfort zone, reaching a, a, a bigger goal than, or, but that just sounds so cliche. It does. I it does. Like, I'm not I, just like trying to find different words no. for exactly that. Yes. Yes. But no, no, no. <laughs> I, I think, yeah, I think that's, it's a tough way to, you know, when I first started asking it, the funny mm-hmm. thing was like, I've thought about it in my own head, how I'd answer it, but I never was mm-hmm. asked it. And then one of the guests turned around and asked me, and I was like, oh, shit. Oh, shit. No, you can't do this. Like, this is my, my show. Podcast. Yeah. <laughs> no, I think that's, I think that was a good way of, mm-hmm. good way of answering it. So. Okay. Wait, can I say one more thing? No. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay. So when I was. When I was traveling as Miss Wyoming, I went all over the state. I spoke to a lot of kids. I went to a lot of schools, did assemblies, and and spoke in classrooms. And the the theme of every talk that I would give was like talking to kids about having the explorer mindset. So to be curious, be open minded be brave and to be actively seeking out opportunities for growth. So to me, that would be what adventure is all about. That's good. Yeah. You're you're coming up with some intelligent things towards the end here. That's, (laughs) (laughs) that's pretty good for, again, the the current state of tiredness that we're both in and, and feeling Mm -hmm. pretty deep. Yeah. (laughs) 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 <laughs> no, it's that's good, Jesse. I I uh I, 
I feel like we just probably scratched the surface of like the life that you live, but I, I hope that it, you know, that, uh, you know, people get to listen to this and really, um, just, like I said, more or less get inspired by the, your journey and everything else. I think it's just a cool story to tell. And I'm glad that you, uh, joined me on here to talk about it. Yeah. Thanks for, thanks for asking me to, I was, I was excited to jump on board and chat a little bit and yeah, hopefully there's some, some little bit that people can pull away and implement into their lives and just light that fire to go get after it. Yeah. So if someone wanted to, um, so a guy or girl or family or whatever wanted to get in contact with you to go on one of your trips, whether it be hunting, whether it be one of the other trips that you do, how would they, how would they do that? How can they find more information on you, um, and your business? Yep. So folks can find our website. It is www.diamond4ranch.com, the number four. And I am on Instagram at miss.jessieallen. And I'm on Facebook. And you can find all the contact info for the business on our website. And yeah, we're I have a a wide variety of trips for families, for singles, for couples, for kids, and I am also always hiring. So any, any folks needing to get a summer and fall job, you call me up. Yeah. All right. Well, yeah, maybe I'll give you a call. See if you need need some help guiding. Okay. You know where to find me. If you want the shitty elk hunter to guide. I really do. (laughs) (laughs) It'll be great. (laughs) <laughs> I'll put all the links in the in the show notes here for anyone to check out. And again, thanks for coming on, Jesse. Cool. Thank you. Thanks so much for listening to this episode of East Meets West Hunt with your host, Bo Martonic. For more great content and to stay up to date, visit eastmeetswesthunt.com, Facebook at East Meets West Outdoors, and Instagram at East Meets West Hunt. If you enjoyed today's episode, please review and subscribe, and we'll catch you next time.